Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined by Bobby Burton, back from vacation, and Jerry Hamilton. And guys, we are now down to single-digit days. Finally, it's little more than a week away, eight days till spring football starts. Hey, who yeah. is number eight there? Who's number eight in that video, in that picture? Like, uh, Brooks. Brooks. Terrence Brooks. Uh, Terrence Brooks, okay. I was wondering if we are going to use Cedric Griffins and Cedric comes on the show so much. <laughs> that that would have been a good one. Yeah, that would be good. We would have used Jordan Shipley if Bob was on this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Bob said he had enough last week of me, so he needs a break. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jerry. So start with some basketball news. Longhorns, yeah. Big 12 uh, regular season complete. Longhorns finished tied for what, seventh, I believe? Yeah. Um, 10 and 10 or 10 and 8 in conference play, 9 and 9, one of those nine two. And nine. Where, where are they at uh, as it relates to what you expected going into the season? Kind of give us a little season review as well as the rest of the Big 12 and what we're looking forward to the rest of the year. Yeah, I had I had Texas if they kind of maximized their season at twenty two and nine the regular season. That's kind of how I had it pegged, um, and that would have been ten and eight conference play. Is kind of what I thought from for these guys headed in. That UCF home loss is the one that stings in conference. That is the one that you really look at and say, okay, bad loss. Okay, and it hasn't Texas in the NCAA tournament, so it didn't end up costing them there. But if you end up on the 8-9 seed and you're looking up at a second-round game, if you get past an 8-9 game and you're looking up at Tennessee, UConn, or Purdue, then that UCF loss is, is really hurt you. Uh, because I do think if they had won that game uh, and you're sitting at 21-10, and 10-8 and right now, I do believe Texas is, is definitely a 7 seed in the tournament right now. I, I think that one loss does impact you that much when you're on the line. Um, you know, look, I, I think there's, it, it's been a struggle, but you know, the key, the, the thing is, is Dylan Dessou was out for eight months. He, you know, you, I don't think you were beating UConn and Marquette with him because Texas just wasn't playing well enough early in the season. I think UConn's a better team, um, but a much better team than most, but then Caden Shedrick has shoulder, multiple shoulder surgeries when he comes in to clean things up. So, uh, Texas didn't have they didn't have their full complement of guys to really prepare for the season. So they started with some setbacks. Uh, and then Tyrese Hunter has not played very consistently at all this year, to say the least. He had his best game of his Texas career Saturday in the big win over Oklahoma. Uh, but you add all those things up together, um, and, and, and they haven't quite been where you would hope to be to maximize the season. Now, I say all that to say this. They're on that seven, eight seed line. Uh, most people are, uh, bracketology has them as an eight seed right now. I, I tend to think there's a shot they get a seven seed, but probably an eight seed. But if you could go win two games, this first game doesn't matter for seeding. Texas plays Kansas State in the 10. Uh, they're a 10 seed, Texas is seven on Wednesday. That one doesn't matter for seeding win or lose to me. But if they can win that game and then upset Iowa State, then I do think Texas will bump to a seven seed, and that makes all the difference in the world. Uh, but I'll say this, Texas offensively, very good basketball team. Very good because they have two guys you can play through in Acemas and Disu. And both of those guys, if they play well on the same night, a couple of nights in a row, you can find yourself in the Sweet 16. I mean, that's how talented Texas is offensively. Uh, on a neutral site and talent neutralized situations, but they really need that third guy. They need Tyrese Hunter. He he's not going to have replicate what he did Saturday, but they need him to play well. Um, and so I, I think that I think inserting, I think finding Brock Cunningham, finding his role, going away from the big lineup saved the season. By the way, that was bad. It wasn't going to work. Um, and then Kendall Weaver's continued growth. I wish that had been accelerated earlier, but his continued growth has been big. Uh, for Texas. So they're a very, very good offensive team. They're not bad defensively. They're a little bit higher in the middle of the road defensively for me, uh, but they shoot the three well enough. They make free throws and they have a couple of go-to guys. Uh, so you can win in the tournament with that, uh, but they, it, it would be beneficial to get off the eight seed line. 
I, I, Houston by far the best team in the league. Is that is that your well, opinion? Yeah. So Houston is the number one. They're going to be a number one seed. They won the Big Twelve. This is the worst Kansas team I've seen under Bill Self and maybe Roy. It's been a long time since I've seen a Kansas team that was this vulnerable. Um, and I kind of expected it, but I'm not sure I expected 10 and 8. But Kevin McCullough's been injured, and their lows have been really low this year for Kansas basketball. So, I mean, they lost by 30 to Houston Saturday in the Fertitta Center. So, I mean, that was a uh, – I'm sorry, I think they believe – yeah, in the Fertitta Center. I mean, they got – Texas has had some bad blowout losses. Kansas, I mean, they lost by 29 in Lubbock and now 30 at Houston. They've had some brutal losses. For a blue blood basketball fan base, I haven't been on their boards, but I'm sure they are pulling their hair out right now uh, with this team. Uh, but yeah, Houston's Houston is the number one seed in the Big 12 tournament. They won the Big 12. They are a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. But I'll say this: I'm very interested. They Houston needs a good draw. With all that being said, because the one area they've always struggled is they have a great style of play to do to be a great regular season team. But eventually, somebody's going to score against your really good, aggressive defense and physical defense. And when that game comes, Elite Eight game, Final Four game, maybe Sweet 16 game, when that game comes and somebody puts 76 points up on you, can you score 78? That's always been Kelvin Sampson's struggles uh, when it gets down to uh, that time of year. Um, and they, they need a good draw. Uh, Houston needs a good draw to uh, get to a national title game. As, as good as they look in the regular season, I think the same issue that they've had in the past is going to creep up again on them. Uh, so if their guards don't shoot it well at the right time because of that style of play, there's a lot of pressure on them offensively if you come up against the UConn and they put 76 points on the board against you. So uh, that Iowa State's probably been, you know, They've been the surprise. That guy's done a great job at Iowa State. He should be the Big 12 coach of the year. I don't know if he'll get it, uh, but they've done a good job. This year it's a nine-bid league right now. I think Kansas State's definitely on the outside looking in. I think nine teams are in. Oklahoma in right now in the NCAA tournament. We'll see what happens. 39? Oh, wait a minute. There is a there is a super chat that just flashed across the screen from one Krista Monroe. Uh, Blake, you're 39 years old today. 39 years old today. <laughs> Is this your first trip at 39? Or are you like uh, some of those people that have like five or six uh, trips at 39? <laughs> Fortunately, this is my first trip, so but getting closer to forty—that's a uh, an eye opener for sure, no doubt about Happy it. Happy birthday, Blake! Happy okay. birthday, buddy! Thank and you. Appreciate it. I hope you have a great day. Oh, hey, hey uh, you broke the tank. Play attention. Said you look twenty-nine. That's good. Hey, yes. I won't argue with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> hey guys, I, 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 we, got we have a couple. Here. Yeah, we have a couple other thoughts uh, on this. Did y'all see the uh, the thing over the weekend where the Italian mob apparently uh, tried to influence a Vanderbilt quarterback into throwing a game? Uh, yeah. This is on top of what we saw. I don't know if you read the article about the basketball game between I think it was Temple and Saint. Who was it? Who was the basketball game that Pat Forty did it? A seven point swing. In one day. No. And then Temple went out and lost, I think, by 28 points. Um, betting in college fo football and basketball is going to be a topic this offseason, I do believe, with NIL now a part of it. Money is flowing more freely. I, I got to be honest. I've seen some suspicious things in college basketball this year to me, being a guy that's watched it for a long time. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics, but I've seen two or three things that have made me very suspicious this year on the court. Hey, the, was it, I can't remember. It was Temple and another team, but Pat Forty did this expose. Literally, they went from a one-and-a-half-point favorite to a seven-and-a-half-point favorite in less than 24 hours. That And there were no injuries. There were no – nothing Nothing changed. That doesn't, I, that doesn't seen, happen. I've seen way too much wildly inconsistent play from some players that it should not be happening this year. I'm suspicious. I'll say that. So a lot of people 
I read I actually read the story on Reddit, I think Saturday morning or something like that. And most people were quick to dismiss it. And like Blake Bryant says, yeah, I don't buy that. He only attempted like 17 passes in his career. Well, he's not saying the mob came to him. He's saying that they came to certain players on the team is what I read. Um, And so, but I don't know. It was very quickly dismissed, it seems like, by fans, you know, online in the college. Well, I've got to be honest. The Vanderbilt doesn't have much effect on it other than, I mean, you're going to the wrong team, right? I mean, they don't really control much of the outcome in, in most of their games. That that would be my – that it doesn't pass the sniff test, right? Um, but this UAB Temple basketball game, that's a whole different can of worms, man. I mean, you don't – you do not see a seven-point basketball change in 24 hours when there are no injuries. I mean, you just – you don't, and it's a fairly innocuous basketball game. It's not like it's, I don't know, Kansas versus North Carolina and the whole world's interested in it. It's UAB versus Temple. You know, give me a break. I, uh, look, look, I, I've i said, and it's happened. Um, yes, Blake Bryant, bas- college basketball to me is the worry with all this. I mean, there's been point shaving scandals in the past. I mean, she- Shevin Smith at Arizona State from Dallas area. That I mean, that was a big one at the time. Uh, there's been stuff for years in college basketball. It's easier to affect um, to me. Um, and like I said, I've seen some suspicious things this year, which I will never go into uh, on a on this. But um, uh, yeah, I think it's a concern. Well, I mean, look, you, you have what happened at Iowa State this past off season, losing Hunter Deckers. And a couple of players from their their starting roster, Iowa and Iowa State, both had those issues. Uh, Kayshawn Booty uh, was betting apparently on himself um, at uh, LSU last year the, or two years ago. The wide receiver, this daily fantasy stuff that we talk about, that might uh, that seems to be playing into it a little bit. But I'm when you start seeing a seven point thing, a seven point train uh, change, that's a totally different category that this isn't oh i'm gonna score one touchdown like hunter decker is maybe saying i'm gonna score one one touchdown rushing or whatever right yeah that's wrong we i think we can all agree you shouldn't be betting on yourself or anything if you're involved in sports but it seems to be a different category when a point it's becomes not just point shaving it becomes game altering right I don't know that Hunter Decker's what he did altered the game, whereas something's going on uh, there. And it's I, I don't want to excuse away some of that stuff, but you gotta you gotta talk about it yeah. because frankly, that it goes to the integrity of the game itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, by the way, uh, women's basketball uh, Big Twelve tournament semifinal today against Kansas State. It's Texas versus Kansas State week in the Big Twelve tournament. Clearly, uh, on the other side, Iowa State and Oklahoma. Oklahoma has been the thorn in Texas side this year on the women's side. So uh, it'd be nice to see Iowa State upset OU. Texas can handle business uh, and, and get to the Big Twelve women's final. Uh, looking like a two seed for Texas. All right, Bobby, before we move on, we still have lots to talk about before we uh, get to questions and plenty of time to get your questions in, so please do so. But can you tell folks out there about John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group? Uh, Yeah, well, with a name like Donovan, John must wish all his fellow Longhorns and the entire On Texas Football family a blessed St. Patrick's Day this coming weekend. And here's to hoping our men's basketball team can get a wee bit of that Irish luck in their Big 12 tournament run. Uh, Rather than relying upon luck, however, when it comes to your finances, John wants you to turn to the Longhorn Wealth Management team to help you secure your own pot of gold with the real knowledge and expertise they offer. So please call John Donovan and his team at Longhorn Wealth at 972-707-4900 or visit longhornwealth.net for your free, that's right, free 90-minute consultation to explore how they can help you achieve true financial independence. Uh, That's 972-707-4900. 
800-242-4900 for a 90-minute free consultation with John Donovan and his team at Longhorn Wealth Management. All right. Well, recruiting, lots going on there. Jerry, what's the latest? Yeah, up to about 30 official, 31 official visitors uh, with dates that have been confirmed. And that does not include guys like Jordan Davison, who told me last week, I have my date locked into Texas. I'm just not announcing it publicly yet. DeCorian Moore will officially visit Texas. We'll wait on that date. So uh, that number will grow, continue to grow. It'll get close to double that number when it's all said and done for official visits for Texas. Uh, but up to 31. Right now, uh, LSU had a big visit weekend. A uh, number of guys were at LSU, Elijah Barnes, uh, Zion Williams, uh, you know, Tyler Thomas from Dickinson, Dylan Battle. I mean, it was a big visit weekend for LSU uh, March 9th. So uh, a lot of Texas targets there. I actually wrote something on OnTexasFootball.com that's published right now. I put it up this morning. Some of those key recruiting battles. What's going on? Where are they going to be at both regionally and nationally? I listed about a dozen guys uh, that are so impactful this year in this cycle. Uh, offensive line's a big one regionally in state because their AM has a ton of pressure to win some in state recruiting battles on the offensive line. They have to rebuild that offensive line and quickly. Um, and then Oklahoma and Texas. I mean, you know, Michael Fasusi is going to be the name there because he's in DFW at Louisville. And Texas and OU have been on top for so long there. And then AM got them on campus. I mean, Oregon and Missouri there too. But those three teams really battling for a five-star offensive tackle out of Louisville, Texas. And then you have guys in the Houston area, Jonte Newman um, and Tyler Thomas at Dickinson. And then you have Jackson Christman and Golden Triangle. I mean, AM's got to win some of those battles. Texas is going to win some of those battles. Can LSU or Oklahoma come in there and win one of those battles. So offensive line, because it's such a great year in state, and there's pressure on AM to win those battles, and Texas wants to continue to win those battles. And then Bill, Bill Biedenbaugh's trying. He's already won Ryan Foji out of Bridgeland. Um, so you have some real good offensive line battles, but then Texas LSU are going to be battled. I mean, DeCorey and Moore, obviously, is one. You know, Elijah Barnes was just down there uh, over the weekend. Uh, so Pettijon, Riley Pettijon running a 10-9-8. At 210 pounds in the 100 meters, fully automatic time. Just, just amped up that national recruitment a little bit more with Texas. I think in a good position going up against Ohio State, USC, and uh, you know Texas A&M and, and Florida State there. So uh, and uh, you know Ohio State obviously in on both Barnes and Pettijohn. So there's some huge national recruiting battles and some huge recruiting uh, regional battles that are really starting to take shape. Um, and then, you know, the a big one for me is Brandon Brown, the Texas commit out of O'Galley. Uh, you know, he's coming in March 22nd for his first unofficial visit to Texas, first time he'll meet Kenny Baker. But you have USC and Tennessee and Florida where he had a multiple family members play there in Miami. I mean, so you have a big national battle there as Texas continues to dip those toes in the Florida. And I'll say this, there's a big national recruiting battle brewing that Texas has not been a part of since Sarkeesian's been at Texas. They've had success in Orlando and down in that Southwest Corridor, IMG. Obviously, last year they were battling on some other guys in the Tampa area. But now Texas is in Jacksonville at Mandarin High School uh, battling for one of the top receivers in the country, Jamie French. Uh, and why that's so interesting is he's a former Alabama commitment that backed off of that when Nick Saban retired. But it's Ohio State. It's Florida State. It's Miami, um, and, and it's, it's um, Texas is now in the mix there as well. Uh, so we can't count out on Alabama. I don't think they're going to get them at this point. But that Texas is now trying in the Jacksonville area on a top flight national prospect earlier, and they're guaranteed to get them on campus twice, April 6th for an unofficial visit, and then June 21st through 23rd for an official visit. So Texas is locked in a first battle in Jacksonville nationally against national powers and in-state uh, powers there. So uh, it's going to be a fun recruiting cycle for Texas fans. This is why you move to the SEC. I jokingly say gird up your loins, but uh, there's some uh, big recruitments uh, starting to take shape. Somebody's asking any highs coming up. Eh, hit me back in April. <laughs> that, that's when the next big – Texas is going to have some guys in in March, right? But yeah. The majority of the unofficial visitors will be coming in April. Uh, the Texas spring game, there's a couple other things. 
Texas spring game is April 20th. Yep. Texas Pro Day is March 20th. So that's yep. only nine days away now uh, as well. Uh, they start back up spring ball just in eight days, as we talked about. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. One thing I wrote about this morning, Jerry, was exactly where they're going. I, I wrote about a recruiting strategy change this morning on, on, on Texas football that I really believe is ongoing. And I wanted to get your take on it. Texas has offered defensive linemen, either edge or interior guys, from 11 different states plus Texas. Yeah. That is by far the widest net they've casted at that. There are 40 scholarship offers right now out for defensive tackles and edge players across the country. That's by far the most of any position. Okay. And that means that, I mean, Bo Davis. Love him. He liked to stay along the I-10, I-20 corridor and head east. Right, Jerry? And that's pretty much what he – and go to East Texas, all that stuff, right? But I-10, I-20. Texas offered guys from Tennessee, Indiana, California, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, do they have chances with those guys? I, I mean, I don't know. But they're certainly doing more nationally and casting a wider net at defensive line this year. And I wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. And will it be fruitful or is it just a whole bunch of nothing? You know, I mean, there, there's, yeah, there's a certain aspect of that that makes me wonder why are they even doing it at all? Well, I mean, sometimes you got to put your, your hook in the water to catch a fish, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, like in the case of Ethan Utley out of Tennessee, that was actually uh, Bo Davis offered him a year ago and that's been Texas, Tennessee battle. Uh, and I, Texas was arguably in front of that when Bo left to go to LSU. So there's some of those that were prior offers. But I think the big change for me will be, um, you know, with Tashar Choice and Kenny Baker, they're really going to try to hit Georgia harder. And Florida. And Florida. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. But he, Florida, Texas already had some success. Uh, Georgia, they've had zero actually getting guys to the finish line. I think they're really going to make a concerted effort there. Uh, Georgia has so many – there's so many defensive line edge players that are high level guys coming out of there every year. Georgia being a national program is only, can only take so many. And now that Nick's not at Alabama, right? I think it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the state of Georgia and Clemson stars fallen enough. They're still going to win some battles, but they're no longer right there with a a Alabama and Ohio state in Georgia right now. So have they fallen enough to where it's going to impact them uh, losing to a couple of those D-line battles, which they've been they won for many years? Um, that's what's going to be interesting as, as everything kind of shifts and changes. Florida State's making a run in Georgia at some guys more so than they have in the past, maybe when Clemson was uh, on top of college football with Nick Saban and then Georgia's climb with Kirby. Uh, so it, it's going to be so interesting if Texas can capitalize in Georgia. The thing about Georgia is Atla it's, there's Atlanta Metro, then there's South Georgia, and there's a ton of talent uh, in South Georgia. Um, but uh, look, Louisiana is going to be tougher now for Texas. There's no doubt with Corey Raymond and Bo Davis and Frank Wilson all working together there. Um, but I, for the people that don't, that here's the one thing I'll say. Uh, I think it, it's funny. Recruiting is always funny in in Fans are always funny because when a coach is here, he's great. When he leaves, he was terrible. Yeah, no, that happens. And for people that think Bo Davis can't recruit, y'all are nuts and crazy. I'll, I'll just tell you that. Just go look at the history. Um, you know, there's guys that look for fits that they know are going to be fits for them. Um, and then there's guys that are just going to uh, numbers recruit and volume recruit. Uh, there's diff different ways to get it done. And then there's also the NIL aspect of it. I mean, Texas has to come uh, big in, in, in D-line recruiting, bottom line. You're not going to win these battles without it. Well, they're, they're definitely what, – what my point is, is not necessarily a, to denigrate Bo Davis at all. It's just different. I mean, Bo, to your point, my point was Bo liked to recruit maybe eight to ten guys, Jerry. Texas is casting a much wider net now. That's my point. So, and, and to your, to, to what you said, there's two ways, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Yeah. Right. You can have different ways to success and succeed. And I think 
maybe in a situation where Texas needs volume as well as quality this year, might be a better might be a better route. At least that's what Steve Sarkeesian thinks. It looks like early on, uh, at least in this situation. Hey, hey, Jerry and, and Blake. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to uh, talk about this morning, if we got a chance, uh, is really uh, the roster uh, release last week. I didn't get a chance uh, to talk with you guys about that when that that all came out. Any prevailing thoughts that y'all had from any of that? Whether it was, uh, I don't know, numbers given, size given. Uh, what three guys listed over three seventy? Is that right? Was Stro Williams? And uh, Sadir Mitchell, what was what? What was uh, Williams' official? Three sixty nine, three six. Okay, excuse me. He's one pound off from three seventy. Uh, well, he may have been actually three sixty. I, I will have to check. Okay, but my, my my point being though, was there anything any prevailing thoughts that y'all had taken away from that? Uh, if it that y'all discussed, your uh, volume's off, Blake. Yeah, I thought Ryan Wingo being two hundred eight pounds on his first official uh, roster release by Texas. Christian Clark being 210. Okay. <laughs> That's a look. He's Christian Clark kind of reminded me of a state of Florida kid in a way because, you know, look, he, he played linebacker. He played running back. He kind of played all over, right? Uh, for, for his high school team. And he, he wasn't in one of those traditional programs like in the state of Texas or those metro Atlanta areas where kids were physically mature when they leave high school or more mature than some other kids. Uh, you could sell, tell if you saw Christian Clark in person that he was going to stack some pretty good weight in a short amount of time because he had that great running back body frame build naturally through the hips, through the legs. He had that natural strength, the calves. I mean, so him going from 195 to 200 pounds when he left high school to 210 now, not a total surprise. He's going to be 220 pounds one day and uh, love where he can go physically. Um, Jordan Johnson Rebel plus about 15 pounds. Um, you know, that's, a um, that's, a that's another one for me that he's really close. He's going to maximize that frame. Uh, Jarrett Gibson being two eleven already, right. He, that's about the same as he was at the Under Armour game, but how physically ready he is. Uh, so those are some of my takeaways with some of the freshmen, um, you know, uh, Blake, uh, sorry, Brandon Baker as well, 297 pounds up from probably 282 his start of his senior year. That's not a surprise. He was going to stack on some good weight as well once he got to a college strength and conditioning program. Um, and I said this before, Daniel Cruz at 307, that's not really a surprise if you saw him. He's one of the few guys on the offensive line that when he left high school, I said, okay, this guy's power five ready now to go in and compete. If he had to, he's physically strong enough his frame is is where it needs to be, that he could go compete from day one on the offensive line. That's a hard thing to do, especially for an early enrollee, but he's one of the few guys that could do it. Blake, you have anything? Yeah, so I was going to ask y'all, actually. So they listed Quinn Ewers 10 pounds heavier, Arch Manning 8 pounds heavier. What would be the ideal weight, y'all think, in y'all's eyes for both of them? I think Quinn needs to be one of those guys that gains three to five pounds of muscle in his trunk every year you know to get up to about 220 that's that's really what i think i mean if you really and what i mean i'm not talking about a, a heavy up up top he needs more strength in his lower half uh that that's that's going to make him uh more stout in the pocket i think less worrying about his leg getting tangled and yet he can still use his arm off platform that way so it, it and Quinn Ewers is not a guy that's going to be finished growing next year. So you're not going to what I mean by that is you're not going to see a, a 220 pound Quinn Ewers next year. You may see it in five years when he's playing for I don't know who. I mean the, the Jaguars, the Bears, the Colts, whoever, right? That draft him. But that's that's how far his body had to go, I think, um, and has to go because it wasn't something that he was really that attuned to, and he's a later developer physically like that. So I think that's going to be one of those pieces. Um, I'm not, Manning is such a, a stout build guy from the, I mean, he's already well proportioned in just different types, body types, really not a big deal. I don't think that's a big deal. I had some other things. Jerry mentioned Christian Clark. Christian Clark came in at 210. 
Jarrett Gibson, we seen how rocked up he is, Jerry. Jarrett Gibson only came in at 211. So if Christian Clark's 210 and Jarrett Gibson's 211, that looks different <laughs> on those two. Oh, there you go. Happy birthday to Blake. Blake, you're 30. Yeah, I love that because he spent his uh, dad's money for the super <laughs> chat. Happy birthday. That's the best happy birthday ever. That was my first thought. <laughs> I, another one, another one that I, I think people need to check in on that I was looking down. Justice Finkley, Jerry. 284 now. No, no, that no, I don't I don't think that's right. That's I I'm pretty sure they've got it in me 284 right now. Or, no, 248. Look. Yeah, he's I'm actually down. Ready. He's yeah. actually oh. down. God, I was like, you're kidding yeah. me. Yeah. He's he he's actually down a little bit from last year, apparently. Um, you know, I I I don't know. I think the um one of the ones Dre Bledsoe's now up to 293 pounds. Uh, he's a guy that when he came out of high school, him and Jamon Tapp were the, as raw as any two guys in that 22 class, uh, but they were also extremely talented players. This is now the time where Jare Bledsoe, now that his weight, he was 287 in December workouts. Now that he's up over 290, this is the time for him to really start make, taking steps. You know, he he had the hernia surgery, surgery midway through spring practice when he was an early enrollee. That kind of set him back physically for a while. So he's been in this longer process. We talk about all these guys develop at different times and different stages. It's not all the same, right? It's not add water instant player. So he said he needed time physically uh, and technically, but physically to really get to where he needs to be. Uh, and Jure Bledsoe, he's now getting there because pound for pound, he's as good an athlete as there is in the program. This is a year for him to start taking a step. Um, Vernon Broughton at 307 on the roster, finally over 300 pounds. It takes these guys a while. The, D, the interior D-line is still a developmental position, and it always will be. Um, and these guys take time to build those frames, um, it, not only technically as pass rushers, because it's just all bull rush and it's easy to do in high school when you're a bigger and better athlete than everybody else, uh, but it's technical and it's physical. And, and Texas has some guys that are now, we'll see what they look like in eight days on the hoof, but now weight-wise, you're starting to see that the pounds have been added over time to where, especially moving to the SEC, where they're going to be physically ready to compete, play in, play out. Let me ask you this, Jerry. Does this worry you? Does this worry you? Kobe Black, 6'2", 204 as a corner. Is that too heavy for a true freshman corner? Does that tell me that – I mean, that's that's heavier than Ryan Watts was as a true freshman. Yeah. Or so, as a, I mean – So my takeaway at the Under Armour practice, watching Kobe Black or just – kind of being there and seeing him was he was 200 pounds and he didn't have much muscle definition because he's a smaller school, multiple sport guy. Yep. So he wasn't, he wasn't in the power programs at Houston or Dallas, right? Um, he was playing multiple sports all the time. If he was 200 pounds at that time, I said, this guy, it's going to be hard for him not to be 212, 215. That, that's just the reality of his frame. If he's 200 pounds at Under Armour, 198, right around there, when they, when he, a year into a college strength and conditioning program, they're going to have to work to keep him under 210. Yeah. I, I'm just looking at him. He's 6'2, 204. Terrence Brooks uh, is a corner, six foot 209. But that's also as a junior in height right. in college. He's got right. two years on him. Yeah. So I, I feel like that may portend black. You can't say it for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't get a look at safety long term. Because if he can't get it down, if he can't keep it below that and remain functionally fast, that's going to be really tough for him long term. Yeah. And by the way, with Terrence Brooks, when you talk about a guy weighing 209, he has got an 80 inch oh. wingspan, right? He has long, super long arm, and he's 5'11, probably 5'11 and a half. So he's super long arm for his height. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's a plus seven, plus eight wingspan guy. So that weight's going to be carried a little different. Absolutely. So two others, though, Anthony Hill, nine pounds heavier, and Trey Moore, seven pounds heavier than his listed UTSA weight. Yeah, the, the Anthony Hill was, he was two, I believe he was 228 when he reported to Texas in, as an early enrollee. So he's up 15 and it's great weight. He's up from nine pounds from 234 on last season's roster, as you pointed out, Blake. But uh, really good nap progression for him. He's getting pretty close 
to his tap out weight, I believe. Um, so, I, you know, I think you could see him playing 245, 247 probably um, it, it, the rest of his career at Texas. He's, he's, he's ahead of the curve on those guys in, in, that, in that regard. Uh, so I think he's getting close. Uh, Colin Simmons, what was he, 233 on that roster? So he is plus about 15 pounds from Under Armour. I think he was about 218 at Under Armour. So he is about plus 15. I think you'll eventually see him get to that 245, 250, kind of tap out uh, weight for him in college. All right, guys. Well, Jerry, you need to tell folks out there about one of our newest sponsors, Mando. Mando, guys. No, no, it's not. I know it sounds similar, but Mando, here, my guys, you ever lift a little too hard or just forget to apply your daily deodorant and get hit by a truckload of BO from all directions? Texas Tech fans, I'm looking at y'all because, man, y'all stink against Texas and Lubbock. Let's just be real. Okay. <laughs> Does that three-in-one shampoo leave you needing a second shower for just a few hours after the first? From the founders of Lume, Mando Whole Body Deodorant is helping men conquer their odor in a new way. Formulated with mandelic acid, Mando is a long-lasting 72-hour odor control that actually stops odor before it starts. Best part is you can put Mando everywhere. Pits, packages, feet, skin folds. Back, knees, everywhere. To top it off, Mando's cologne. Quality scents were created with men in mind. Pro tip, try their best-selling scent, bourbon, leather. It's a game changer. Again, Tech fans, I'm looking at y'all. When y'all play Texas, it's been stinky up there in Lubbock. Once you experience fresher underarms, a fresher package, and fresher feet, you'll never go back. Special offer. New customers get $5 off a starter pack with our exclusive code and link used on Texas, all caps, at shopmando.com. Shopmando.com. I got to say this. This is, a, this is a good read, and I can actually comment on this because I've actually used the product and my wife approves. So there you go. <laughs> yep, it's not pretty good. Hey, by, the way, by, the, by the way, I, I mentioned this Friday or over the weekend. I, I love Coach McGuire, right? I've known him for years. I went to Cedar Hill for many years. But ever since everything runs through Lubbock, boy, it's been a stinker for Texas Tech against Texas. What What do we think about all this uh, Big 12 discussion that we're hearing right now, guys? Uh, trying to maybe add and pick off some ACC teams. The ACC uh, embroiled in, I guess, what you would call uh, litigation you know, from from uh, Florida State's perspective, trying to get out of the grant of rights. I mean, where does this all land? You know, that's kind of where it, it, foot, college football is in this kind of crazy era. Yeah. Like where does NIL land? Right. What, where, when did, what about revenue sharing? Heck, we just had, you know, implosion of the Pac-12. Now, you know, do we continue that on with the ACC? where ACC and Big 12 have to become one conference to get their share at the table or seat at the table. Um, I, I don't know what to say to all this, uh, to be honest with you. I, I feel like there's a lot of different questions there. I'm interested probably uh, right now on what they do with, with NIL as it relates to revenue sharing and the players. Because yeah. I think that that's going to lead to everything else. That's got to be the first mover. It can't be... I mean, otherwise you're just reshuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. Yeah. You know, people people love you picking on Texas Tech, by the way, Jerry. I Easy target. Them. Easy target right now. The Red Raiders are they're just not they they uh they may have bitten off more than they can chew. Well, but, let's be well, let's be real. I mean, 57-7 in football. Ooh. I mean, look, um, Texas goes and wins at tech the last basketball game Texas will play at tech for a long time to the point where the fans look like idiots throwing things on the court and <laughs> just, just, no, they're, just acting, they're acting like tech fans always do. Jerry. Acting the fool. Then Texas wins two or three in baseball over the weekend scores 22 uh, 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 to get the series started. So, I mean, look, it's been a, it's been a rough go up in Lubbock uh, uh, against Texas. Uh, even though the Texas, Texas Tech football game was in Austin. I mean, you felt that one in Lubbock. 
Yeah. 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 No, no doubt. <laughs> because when the season started and Brett Mor Yormark left that, that, that uh, rally, um, I don't think any Tech fans thought they were going to lose by 50 in Austin. So going back to what you were talking about, Bobby, the rumor is Pitt, Virginia Tech, Louisville, North Carolina State. Now, so my question, Bobby, is, is this a third conference trying to fight to stay at the table long term? Or is somebody, I still see it being the Big Ten and SEC. I still see long term there being two conference, super conferences, and that's it. And everybody else is by the wayside. Um, is this a last try by uh, to have one more conference, by the Big 12 to be the third conference at the table? So time, the out. Five, time out. Say those teams again, Blake. Yeah. So Pitt, Virginia Tech, Louisville, and North Carolina State is so, who is who's well, they're not even going Greg after Virginia. Vir they're not even going after Virginia, North Carolina, Duke, Florida State, Miami. That that's that to me is why that to me is why your mark's trying to be the third conference left standing because that's a sign that you know Duke Carolina um or go at Florida State Miami they're gonna end up in the SEC long term. That's what he's saying by going after those schools. Uh, he may be forcing the SEC to take them. Well I, I think you're I think people are already like chalking those up. Yeah I don't think team. I don't I just don't think that your mark has that uh, that that swing to force those people to go to like look I mean Sankey's not all right. Sankey's not going to take a, a pay cut to take those teams. They, 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 well, yeah, Sankey's but going to take a pay cut. But this, it's going to be two twenty four team super conferences long term. So I mean, those guys are. And I, I to me, it's a sign that your mark knows who he can get and who he has no shot to get. Like Florida State isn't. If Florida State and Miami aren't aren't ever going to the Big Twelve. Yeah. yeah. BC and Syracuse. I'm just looking at this right. BC and Syracuse are, are the teams that are left out of that in that scenario. Wake Forest obviously was going to get left out regardless. That's interesting. All right. Yeah. Look, but because the natural thing is if you look at the Big Ten, and what are they? Are they at 16 now or 18? Where are they at? 16. 16. Okay. So if you add Notre Dame long term to that. Right. I'm not sure Notre Dame can stay independent in five years where college football's headed. I mean, they're already halfway in the ACC, right? But if you get, if you take a Syracuse, if you add a Boston College to the Big Ten, because look, it's not you're not going to have everybody, right? You're not going to have. So who are you going to add to get the year 24 up there? I think you know who the SEC, if you look at it, would add to get to their 24 or a good chance from the ACC. Who would make sense? who you would want in your super conference if you're the SEC. You would want Florida State. You'd want Miami. You'd want Clemson. You'd want Duke. You'd want North Carolina. And you'd want one more. So I think Brett Yormark sitting there saying, okay, NC State, ha-ha, you're going to be like Oklahoma State. You're actually going to get left, off, left out. You never thought North Carolina and Duke would walk away, but they are. I think that's exactly kind of what we're seeing play out now with what the Big 12 is trying to do. So I do want to add the person that started these or maybe not started, but put out that Pitt, Virginia Tech, Louisville, North Carolina State are possibly going to the Big 12 has not been the most reliable okay. in, when it is rumor mills. So I'll be nice when I say it that way. Uh, but it, the batting record just ain't too good. We'll just we'll just say that. You know, and I see I know people are split on this what, future college football. But, you know, here's where I come out on it, all this. I, I don't think it's bad where it's headed. Um, and, and I say this because we're headed to a, what, a 12? It's 12-team playoff now. It's going to be 14. It'll eventually be 16, in my opinion. 16 teams are actually going to be engaged in a college football playoff long term. I actually think that's a really cool thing and a really good thing. I mean, you know, I was talking to a college coach and – um a while back, we were talking about the, the Boston College job opening. And I was talking to a, a coach in the ACC, and 
He was like, "What? Where? All this stuff is different now." He said, "On the surface, Boston College, tough job, bad job." He said, "The crazy thing, though, is now with a 12-team playoff, and, it, and he was saying it'll get the 14, eventually it'll get the 16." He said, "You, everybody, actually has a chance to make the playoff now." He said, "If you're NC State and you have that really magical 10 and two season, there's a good chance you're the 12 seed or the 14 seed." in the playoff. So that is the good thing. There's some bad that is happening right now that a lot of fans don't like, but there's also the good uh, that's happening as well for, because forever, and even Texas fans in the downturn that the last decade were saying this, I mean, look, it, it's all SEC. They're going to get the benefit of the doubt. And, you know, you know who the four teams are going to be in the playoff every year. I mean, how many fans were saying this around college football and even some Texas fans saying this now, Look at what Ole Miss is doing. You think Ole Miss would have gone this hard in on the portal this last year if there wasn't a 12-team playoff? They see an opportunity, and they went for it. I, I think the playoffs, I think it's going to be awesome for college football long term. I don't know what about you guys. I think the playoffs are tremendous. Uh, I just hope they don't take away from the regular season, okay? Um, the NFL has done a great job of that, by the way. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there is a, a blueprint for it to work. Um, I also think that, that you know, in the past, Jerry, you lose two games at Texas and you're out of any kind of national championship hunt. Yeah. It, 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 it Adding 16 or 14 or 12 or whatever the number eventually becomes, right? It allows you to stay engaged with your team longer because it'll still matter more. I mean, look, Texas lost to Oklahoma last year. I'm just going to say that the, the interest level, that was a gut punch, first of all, to Texas fans. But the interest level in the Texas football team, and they had already beaten Alabama earlier in the year. It fell off a cliff, believe it or not. I mean, we can track, I can go back and show For you. For about the, a week, it sure track, is. It, yep. I mean, in there was a there was an off week, but you know, college football fans have been conditioned to be care so much about the regular season that the bowl games became an afterthought in many respects. Okay. Adding more playoff teams will make you care more about the whole season, I think, and to getting to the 16. The difference is you have 16 or however many make the playoffs. In the NFL, is it 12? Is that right? Um, or 14? I can't remember. But my point being, they only have 30 teams in the NFL, 30, whatever the number is. And so it will it will impact how you watch and care about college football for the entire season a little bit. Yep. But again, I think the blueprint for college football in this regard is the NFL. That's how you keep interest in the regular season. And that's how you keep interest in the playoffs. And I'll, tell, I'll say another thing. And Steve Sarkeesian said it as February press conference, signing day press conference, even though it wasn't really signing day for Texas. But so it gave him a chance to speak on a lot of things. And one of the things he said that was so interesting to me that I, uh, and I think it's going to make it fun for fans. He said, look, we have to play our depth more. We have to play our younger guys more. We have to get ready to prepare for a college football playoff season. And I thought that was such a great thing to say. And I think it's so true because injuries are, they've been very impactful and all sports are very impactful. I mean, no doubt about it, but it's extremely impactful. Now, when you look ahead at college football, having a 12 or 14 or 16 game playoff season, I mean, that is uh, and Bobby, next thing I want to get to is the change in the early signing period because you were on vacation. We have so we haven't got a chance to talk about that again. But see, to Steve Sarkeesian's point, that depth is going to be more important now than ever. So for fans, I think you're going to see more young guys get on the field. It may be limited snaps, but you're not. We're not, so for so many years we've been talking about this guy. What's he going to look like next year? We didn't get to see him on the field this year. I think you're going to see more guys play a limited amount of time. Because to Bobby's point, one loss doesn't knock you out. Three losses knocks you out. But you have to get to that finish line with the healthiest team you can. And that is going to push more youth and more guys in, in, in terms of your depth 
are going to play in games moving forward. No doubt about it. I think what Sark said is spot on. Hey, Bobby, your thoughts. So we, right before you went on vacation, ESPN had reported, Pete Thamel reported that it, it looked like a Dece early December signing period would happen and a June signing period was possible. So they shelved the June signing period. They're going to vote on that, I believe, in this June, which means they've kicked it down the can and it'll start in 26, essentially. But in 2025, in this class, December 4th through 6th, early signing period will happen. And, and I, we talked about it briefly, but now that you've had some time to think about it, your thoughts, because look, the portal window, it's before the portal window opens. Um, it, and with the 12-team college football playoff, you could not have a December 18th through 20th signing period. There's no chance it could happen. So kind of what are your thoughts on it all now that it's officially going to happen? I think it's still still stupid. I, I, I They tried to fix signing day. And because there was so, oh, we don't, we, they, these guys don't need to be waiting till February. This is the, for people that there, I, we've talked on this show to people of all ages. Okay. Yeah. So there may be an 80 year old guy in Lake Belton, or there may be a 20 year old in, you know, suburbs of Dallas. Um, what a lot of people don't know that are younger is that it used to be there were conference signing periods as well as national signing periods. So back in the 60s and 70s, you could sign a Big 8 letter of intent as well as a Southwest Conference letter of intent. And then a week later, you would sign your national letter of intent, and that's the one that was binding, okay? Then we went to just one national letter of intent, okay, first Wednesday in February. Well, along came the internet, increased exposure to recruiting. They wanted to make something that was for the student athlete and, oh, well, let's create two, two signing days. We have one in February or one in December and one in February. And I think that what they did, they thought it was so bad in retrospect, one signing day in February is perfectly fine. No. Look, I mean, I don't do that and make people actually sign, not saying, oh, you don't have to sign at all. I, I think this idea of having a December signing period is kind of stupid. Uh, most, I, I, most of January, college coaches have off. They get they can then sign their players in January, take the month of February to get ready for spring ball, stop the, the more signing periods, just put more pressure on more people. Instead of having just one signing period, and, and that's what you look forward to. I, I'm a big... You know, the idea was, oh, well, if they don't get a defensive tackle in December, they can go in January signing period and or in February signing period and add a defensive tackle. It's not how it works. No. And so this whole idea of what they they started by bifurcating uh, the signing period, Jerry, I just disagree with. I think that the whole December signing period is silly and stupid. That's yeah. what I, I think. That, now, now, ultimately, that's what we're dealing with. Right. So we'll deal with it. I think that they should consider pushing it all back uh, to February. That's so all. I, I think what where it's eventually headed, guys, is I think they're kind of uh, putting some 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 band aids on uh, the issue right now. Where this is eventually going to head to me is a late June signing period and a February signing period. Now a lot of people say, "What about the early enrollees?" Okay, so. The, the early enrollees, you sign in December and you're done with it. I mean, you don't need to have a sign. Or they just show up. Right, or just show up. I think where this is eventually going to head, especially with the new ruling about, you know, further accelerating the NIL process, essentially is what just came down. You're going to have a late June signing period, which is what should happen in my estimation. Now, I, I don't know how many what percentage of kids will sign then, but I'm here to tell you, if you're going to have kids go on campus for official visits in April, in May, if you're going to allow that, these kids should not have to wait until December or February to sign because their process is done after June. For a large percentage of these kids, their process is done. Does that mean I think 80% of kids would sign the last Wednesday in June? I don't know about that yet. I think you'd almost have to pull a lot of kids and families on that. But I think where this is ultimately headed is a late June, last Wednesday in June signing period, and then your traditional February signing period. And your early enrollees, like you said, Bobby, just show up. 
Um, I, I think what's interesting, though, is um, when are guys going to fire coaches? That's the that's why that's why you have to wait until February, Jerry. You that that is the that's my whole point on this. But 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 there's too many early enrollees now is the problem with that. I mean, like 17 of Texas 21 guys and they're 22 guys. Allow, the then allow for a December signing period solely for early enrollees. That's where it's headed. It's and gonna none, none of it's June. June of their, before they even play a game their senior year. That's not fair to the colleges. You're talking about all making it for the players. Well, I mean, yeah. the colleges, you know, you, that's not fair either to them. Then well, you don't know what you're really getting. But the colleges of the, the colleges are one that accelerated the process. So it's yeah, all well, they, they, all this is headed. They didn't have me at the table. I know <laughs> they didn't. Have, they didn't obviously. They didn't, they didn't ask me. They didn't talk to people in the business and our side of the business on this. I mean, they're the ones that started offering kids in football in the eighth grade. This is not like AAU basketball where you saw where you could see a TJ Ford and Daniel Ewing in eighth grade and know those guys were high major basketball players. Football has accelerated such a physical developmental sport. They've accelerated the process so much on their own that they've created this problem. So let me ask you all this. Would y'all prefer football to be like baseball where there's no contact with kids or parents until their junior year? Like no, you can't do anything at all until their junior year. I don't think that's realistic. Um, I don't, I don't think that's realistic at all. Uh, I don't mind when they have contact at all. I like that should be, if, if, a, if a guy wants to go out and outwork someone else, let him go out, work someone else. That, my my point is when you actually sign a document, it makes no sense to sit here and belabor, um, you know, what signing in June of a, a prospect before he even plays a se his senior year. That's not that's not having the guy work towards something that that's not smart. Like you don't give somebody the carrot until they actually earn it. You know, and that what are we teaching guy kids like that? That that this that that's more important than actually getting better as a as a student or as an athlete. What well, to put it to put it in what what Bobby's saying? Think about an NFL mock draft before a season and then after a season. Yeah. That's the way I always look at it. So we're so that college football and the coaches have created. They've created. A mock their own mock draft of 2,000 kids before they ever play a game as a senior, and it's on them, they've done it. Okay, but just think to Bobby's point, think about that. Think about if the NFL had to draft these guys before their, before their season, before their final season, or before their draft eligible season. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about here. Hey, by the way, Ski Brick, uh, he was talking about college coaches uh, when they fire AM, did a good job firing Jimbo. They did, and, and I and, and I think they did. I think the AM did that for twofold, though. I think one, you had to get ahead of it, but two, if Jimbo went and beat LSU, they wouldn't have been able to fire him. They had to get, they had to fire him and not give him a chance to win at LSU because if he'd won at LSU, I don't think they could have made the move, and they thought they had to make the move. I I will add this: they also had they also did a good job of keeping their players, but for the most part except yeah. for Evan Stewart and, and Walter Nolan because of NIL. Yeah. They, they had the, the, uh, the structure or infrastructure in place to keep a majority of those guys. So I, I think NIL played a role in that as well. Hey, we need, we, we need to say thank you to our sponsor one more time. And that's John Donovan of uh, Longhorn Wealth Management. John's a proud Texas X's life member. He and his wife and all six of his siblings are also proud UT grads. John has served more than 15 years as a Texas X's board member and is a certified financial planner who has spent more than 30 years providing investment, retirement, insurance, and estate planning and services and solutions to his clients. So it's John's long history with and love for UT that explains why he has dedicated his firm to providing total wealth management for Texas alums, employees, family, and friends. How, uh, rather than uh, just going to somebody you may not know and, and having a conversation, John is offering you 50, uh, a free 90-minute consultation to explore how he can help you achieve true financial uh, independence 
Uh, John wants you to turn to the Longhorn Wealth Team and give him a shout at 972-707-4900. That's 972-707-4900. Or visit longhornwealth.net for more information. Thanks, John, for your uh, ongoing sponsorship of On Texas Football. All right, guys, we'll do some rapid fire questions here. Got a couple of super chats we need to read. Edmund Lee, thank you, Edmund, for the big super chat. He says, Good morning on Texas football from New Braunfels. Welcome back, Manscaped Bobby, and a great birthday wish to Blake. Go Rangers. Hurry up, spring practice, and hook them home. So, thank you, Edmund. Thank, thank you, you, Edmund Lee. By the way, we're not going to get into big discussion about it, but it sure seems like the Texas Rangers have one of the next stars in baseball. Yes, Langford. Whoa. Excited. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa, watch yeah. out. Uh, we're going to go over to the ontexasfootball.com forums real quick for a, a question for you, Jerry. Burnt Cowboy wants to know your top two go uh, your go, top two go to beef jerky oh, flavors. He's going on a long motorcycle trip. Needs That's a good one, Burnt Cowboy. So I love Robertson's at, at, at Love's, but I'm more of the tearaway beef jerky guy more than the soft beef jerky guy. I like a little bit of the hard tearaway, not saying my – my, my jowls appreciate it, but I like it best. <laughs> there you go. Your, and then Jackson. <laughs> Your tennis <laughs> probably doesn't appreciate it either, Jerry. Tyree <laughs> <laughs> Gatson. So it's super chat. Thank you, Tyree. He says, are the rumors of headsets coming to college true? Yes, that's past. Yeah. So they're 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 uh, they're coming. Uh Brent Venables, Venables will be uh, disappointed. No more sign stealing. Yeah, he'll have to he'll have to figure it out another way with formations, etc. Uh, and and by the way, Connor Stallions got out out just in time. <laughs> uh, actually, by the way, Bobby, we mentioned this uh, again. You're we talked about this last week. How many Connor Stallions changed the game of college football? Normally, it's like Shaquille O'Neal in the NBA said, oh, we got to go to a zone because nobody can do anything with this guy, right? We got to implement a zone. It's very rare that the non-player changes the game. Connor Stallions, just he caused major change that needed to happen in college football. I'm just happy I'm not going to see those ridiculous signs on the sideline anymore. What? But I think you that, was like, that was like, I don't know, it was like Saturday morning wrestling cartoon type stuff that they well, put up. But here's the thing. Are we still, though? Because after 15 seconds, the headset goes off, right? I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. But here, my biggest question with this is, and somebody may have the answer. I may, I just haven't read up on it or haven't seen it. Can you change the head? The defensive player that has the headset, can that change within a game? Because that's what's so interesting to me. It's very easy on offense, your quarterback, right? On yep, defense, yep. though, you rotate. Are you going to have a defensive player that's going to play all 80 snaps or 70 snaps in a game? So, Are they going to allow two players to have the headset but only one at the, on the field at the same time? That's the question I have with the rule that's going to have to be talked about in, at some point. Yep. Okay, guys, as we said at the beginning of the show, spring ball, eight days away, and the spring game, of course, right around the corner as well, AJJ Sports. What's the number one thing y'all are going to be looking for at the spring game? Quinn's connection with the receivers. That that I, I think that that will be – that will tell us a little bit of the story. I'm not saying it has to be up to snuff, like ready for, for game one uh, immediately, but his connection with the receivers – um, you know, having lost who he lost um, and who is coming in now. Like, what does Nye Black look like? I mean, we 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 know what he looks like throwing to Jatavian Sanders. Well, Amari Nye Black is a little bit faster. Um, Isaiah Bond is a different receiver than Xavier Worthy. More powerful, let, less maybe shifty, if that's the best way to put it. Um my, Matthew Golden's, you know, got deep. I, I I just think that that's probably it more than anything. How the how they look with a new set of offensive tools. My mine is uh Trey Moore and Colin Simmons and the edge guys. Um, uh, edge pressure that taking that next step as a pass rushing unit, uh, I think is paramount for Texas success in the SEC. 
You're playing against better offensive linemen, better offensive tackles. You're playing against faster athletes. You have to not only be able to pressure the quarterback, but you have to be able to get the quarterback to the ground. It's it's going to be more important than ever uh, for the Texas program moving into the SEC uh, because the the athletes in the offensive alignment are going up about seven notches. Uh, so I, I think Trey Moore, Colin Simmons, uh, what does Ethan Burke look like year three, Baron Sorrell year four, Justice Finkley. Uh, does this look like a group that's going to pressure the quarterback more and be able to get him to the ground a little bit more and truly affect the quarterback? Um, that's going to be big for me for Texas moving forward. Because you also that also helps cover your secondary a little bit. You cannot ask a secondary to cover for an extended period of time against the athletes you're about to go up against in the SEC. Can't do it. Uh, UT boy had this, uh, Bobby, I think two, two, two super chats last night that were not acknowledged. Curious, not sure what happened. I, I didn't see him. I, I came in late to, to last night's live stream guys. Uh, and so I didn't, I, I wasn't running it. Uh, there's no, sorry. It, it would be my best uh, conversation uh, piece on that. Uh, hey, any, any other comments or questions that you had Blake ready to pull up? Uh, my apologies. Tyrese Barmer had one yeah. at 906. That's actually my go-to one right here. Why do people feel like Jaden Blue's style won't translate to the SEC? Jameer Gibbs also played at about 200 pounds. He was clocked as the fastest running back two years ago, and he had no problem running through the SEC. Y'all's thoughts? I uh, Look, I think that the reason – Jameer, Jaden Blue is not Jameer Gibbs, first of all, from a cut perspective. J Jameer Gibbs is an elite make-you-miss guy. Yes. Now, Jaden Blue can make you miss, but he's not as good a make-you-miss guy, in my opinion, as Trey Wiseman. I'm just going to put that out there, okay? So, that's the difference. Jameer, Jameer Gibbs, one-on-one, -on -one, you're likely not, not getting him down if he has a yard of space between them. Right? You agree with that, Jerry? Whereas Jane Blue will just try to accelerate past you. Yeah. So I think it's also, I think that I 100% agree. Um, and then it's also Texas inside zone run scheme. And that that makes everything else go fit in the passing scheme for Sark. So for, for, for Blue, it's all about putting him in every one of his touches. And, that, and that's what, you know, Sark would say, putting guys in the best position to have success. So Sark has to do that a little bit different. You're not going to give... Jaden Blue, 12 carries on inside zone in that run scheme. That's not going to be his strength ever. And that if you ask him to do that, then you're not really putting him in the best position to succeed. So getting him in the space plays, getting him where he can accelerate quickly and work to the second level quicker, uh, I think is going to be the whole key for him uh, in the SEC. Uh, because if you just hand him the ball in the inside zone a lot, you're not going to get the returns you want. Hey Blake, what about you for things that you want to see at at uh, first things in spring ball? What's the most important thing for you? Man, honestly, obviously the ad ad addition of Trey Moore, Colin Simmons. I want to see how how well they perform. Um, but I'm I'm kind of with you on the receivers. I, I'd like to see what kind of chemistry that Quinn has with those guys. I mean, obviously it's going to be early on and there's a lot more time for them to build said chemistry. Uh, but to me, that that's going to be the key on offense is can those, is it going to be plug and play per se? Uh, you know, like we saw last year, that's. One more, I, one more thing I would say is how good is Savea? Uh, the defensive tackle they brought in from, from Arizona. Is he actually going to be able to give you some real snaps? You think he is. They think he's an upgrade over Trill, Trill Carter, right? Um, but I, I think the two sex appeal positions we just talked about, it's wide receiver, Jerry, right? And then your your edge guys getting after the quarterback. Yep. Those are the two ones that have the sex appeal. And, and by the way, the other thing is, um, it's going to be the most people have seen of Arch Manning in a Texas yeah. uniform. Yeah. Because and, last, last year he was uh, – thrown to the wolves probably purposefully because if he'd come out and had a, you know, been putting, got any rep, as many reps with the twos instead of just the threes and put up big numbers, that's not the talk you wanted coming out of spring practice, but now it's here. So it's going to be 
Quinn with the ones, Arch with the twos, and he's going to have an opportunity to have a big, big game. Uh, by the way, that's the other thing with the headsets is uh, does every quarterback get the headset? Does every quarterback have the headset? Oh, yeah. They have to, right? So, but that means that no trickeration bringing in two quarterbacks for a play. That's those small things with this too that's going to go into it. Or they, or they have to turn off one headset or something. I mean, right. I, I think that. Look, my my thought on on it is they're gonna they're gonna find a way to figure out the headset stuff. Um, the the bigger piece that you mentioned with Arch, you know, you're you're right in some regards. They needed and wanted the team to coalesce behind Quinn Ewers last year, and needed to. Sark, that was Sark's goal, right? One of them. One of them. Should have been. Yeah, and, and it was, and it and it worked. So you know, way to go. This year, it needs to be no holds barred. And that's what you're getting at, Jerry. Yeah. And it will be. I, I, I think that we'll see him not only with the twos, I think we'll see him with the ones late in practices. I mean, you know how it works. After the quarterback that's got two years experience gets his reps in, you take him out. You don't yeah. keep burning the midnight oil on that. Yeah. Not, not when you can get a tired arm, that sort of stuff. Now, and by the way, we're not – by the way, I want to be clear about something. I'm not saying there's a quarterback competition. No, 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 no. Wins the quarterback. <laughs> Arch is the number two quarterback. Um, and for those – and for those saying, well, buying into – well, what will Arch leave after the spring practice? Where is he going to go? This has always been my argument on the Arch thing is, will Arch transfer? Should, all these people writing all this BS nationally, should Arch transfer? Where is he going to go? Look at the schools he looked, like, looked at coming out of high school. Texas has their quarterback back. Alabama has their quarterback back. Ole Miss is a third-year starter, Jackson Dart. Clemson's a disaster. Georgia has Beck back. Where's he going to go? For all these people writing all these BS articles, it always pisses me off because they never want to be real. Where are you going to go? It makes no sense to leave because you're in the same situation. So many stupid articles have been written and will be written. I'm done. That was it. <laughs> Hey, let me, let me drive the clicks, though. Hey, two other things that I, I was thinking about, too, for spring. Uh, Sadir Mitchell and the tight ends. Interested to see both of those as well, to kind of see how that unfolds. Which leads me to our last question for today, guys. From Spanish Steve, he says, hook on from Ozark, Missouri. Question for all three. Who's your sleeper pick for this year's team? I'm going to mm. say Gunnar Hale. Good one, Gunner Trey Hansen. Moore. Based on what I've been told, if you, I don't know if, if Trey Moore is a sleeper, but based on what I've been told, I'm I'm marking Trey Moore down. I think that's a good one. Um, I know I, I think I think that's a very good one. Um, nobody nobody else I would really say outside of Trey Moore right now. Um, yeah, and Manny's not Manny, not really a sleeper to me. That's not a bad one. Mo Blackwell at 220 pounds. He's finally put on some weight. What is how different is he going to look on the field with 220 pounds versus 205, 207, 208? Some people think Trey Wisner. I like, I like, Texas has here. Here's here's one. What if Savion Red becomes a fullback? <laughs> I am serious. You know, we we laugh, but you know. That's part of what spring practice is for, is trying to figure out what that is. Based on what I've been told from behind the scenes, it won't be a surprise if Trey Moore is a dude. Yeah. Like, not just a guy, not just one of the, not just out there playing, but an actual dude. Yeah. So, um, keep that in mind as we go forward this spring and hopefully into into, into uh, football. Oh, Cole Hudson, interesting. If he's healthy. That his health is the whole thing with him. Sure. All right, guys. So that's going to do it for today's episode of Coffee and Football. We want to thank John Donovan and Longhorn Wealth Management Group, along with Mando, our newest sponsor, for sponsoring today's show. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for the birthday wishes, by the way, and all the super chats. Uh, be sure to head on over to ontexasfootball.com and continue, continue the discussion there, along with uh, the latest recruiting news, team news, all that good stuff. So we will be back same time, same place tomorrow morning. So for Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you then. Happy birthday.